But the Wilson Center was formed in 1968 as an act of Congress uh, to honor Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and rather than building another memorial on the, on the mall, this serves as a living memorial, uh, quote unquote, uh, to President Wilson. As he was our only president with a PhD, uh, for better or for worse, the, um, the Wilson Center uh, aims to bring together the world of policy and the world of ideas. Uh, so that's what we try to do here through our, our presentations like this, through our publications and our other activities. Uh, the Global Health Initiative is a newer project here at the Center. Um, in addition to serving as sort of a clearinghouse for the 20 or so other programs at the Center who all do a little bit of health work, uh, we focus on three uh, distinct um, areas for our own programming, maternal health, uh, post-conflict health, and uh, health financing schemes. Um, uh, the latter of which is an example today. Um, we're thrilled to be putting this on together with the Mexico Institute, um, Andrew Seeley, Kate Putnam, Robert Donnelly, all been extremely helpful in putting together uh, today's event, so thank you very much. Um, we have three experts really in conditional ca cash transfers with us today, um, and we'll hear from them in this order. Uh, Rogelio Gomez Hermosillo uh, will begin. He is the founder of Oportunidades, the Mexican government's program which now covers, I guess, over 25% of the Mexican population. He was their national coordinator uh, from 2001 to 2006. He's currently the president of Alianza Civica and a consultant with the World Bank and the IADB. His previous NGO activity uh, includes uh, founding and or directing the Citizen Movement for Democracy, uh, La, La, La Fundación Vamos, uh, which is now known as Rostros y Voces. Uh, next, we'll hear from James Riccio. He is the director of the Low Wage Workers and Community Policy Area at the MDRC, which is a national nonprofit uh, social policy research organization headquartered in New York. Uh, he directs several large scale randomized control trials, including an evaluation of Opportunity in New York, which is uh, one of uh, Mayor Bloomberg's main components in his anti poverty strategy. And finally, we'll hear from Michelle Adado, who is a senior research fellow at IFPRI the International Food Policy Research Institute. She leads their global, regional, uh, global and regional program on large-scale human capital interventions and also leads their research theme on AIDS, community resilience, and social protection for their renewal project. Uh, she's been a lead investigator on evaluations of conditional cash transfer programs uh, for many governments around the world. And she is the co-editor of a book which will come out, uh, I guess, hopefully in the spring. Um, on conditional cash transfer programs in Latin America. Much more information about all three of these speakers is available in the bios that are available outside if you didn't get them on your way in. Um, and one final note before we get started is that you can see a camera in the back there. We are webcasting this event um, both now live and in about a week or so we'll have it up archived on uh, both the Mexico Institute and the Global Health Initiative website um, where it will remain uh, in, uh, forever, I suppose, um, <laughs> until there's some sort of meltdown. Um, so wait uh, for a microphone to come around. One of my colleagues will be bringing around microphone during the Q and A and, and let us know uh, here in, in the um, uh, computer audience who you are and, and who your affiliation is. So uh, once again, thanks so much for coming, and uh, we'll start with Rogelio. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for the invitation. Um, I've been asked to talk about the Mexican experience on the conditional gas transfers, and I would like to go over the general view of the program and then concentrate, focus on the health and nutrition um, results. So, first of all, uh, we know that the appreciation, and we were talking <laughs> with James, but in the world, the appreciation for uh, this kind of programs that has been called mostly by the World Bank, conditional cash transfers, uh, have been growing. In 1997, there were only three or four countries having this kind of program. Ten years later, almost every country in Latin America <coughs> and many in Africa, in Africa and Asia are, and New York City, are, <laughs> um, launching or discussing or piloting or have these programs already in full motion. Uh, the reason is that these kind of programs that emerged 
from Latin America, although the World Bank and the IADB have been promoting them, it's important to say that the, the design and the experience came from Latin America, from Brazil with Bolsa Escola, and from Mexico with Progresa, the former name of Oportunidades. So the, the programs are useful because they have been having better performance and achieving impacts in targeting for families. There is a whole study about how these programs target correctly their benefits to poorest families, delivering cash transfers timely and safely, and this is important in our kind of countries where corruption has been an issue for many years, and probably it is now. Improving health service use, uh, for families and especially for pregnant women, for mothers and for uh, small children in their early childhood. Improving school attendance and advancement through education. Improving food intake, that this has been evaluated. Reducing malnutrition, particularly stunting, that is, uh, the, well, in the first years of age. Alleviating poverty, especially the depth and severity of it. And uh, the programs have been, had this performance that has been evalu evaluated, having the outcomes and the, and, the out, uh, and the impacts measured. So there is a, a basic design. I, I, I don't believe there is a recipe for these kind of things, but there is a package that has been in place uh, in most of these countries, and I think it's, uh, it has these things, a targeting mechanism, a way to reach and to select and enroll poor families or poor persons households in the program, a list of conditionalities of behaviors that want to be uh, enforced and that want to be promoted by the program, and mostly dealing with the use of health services and the attendance to school, so it has no intervention in the quality of the, of the education and on the performance inside the school. Uh, a permanent and systematic way of verifying the compliance of the, of the members of the families on this, on this list of conditionalities. Um, very important, a paying mechanism, a paying agency um, in most of our countries is outsourced through a bank or a similar type of institution. In Mexico, it's uh, Telegrafos, it's uh, the wire transfer agency, Telecom, uh, the first one that was a paying agency. And a monitoring and evaluation system, also with the participation of a third party. In the case of Mexico, the, the IFPRI was the first uh, organization to conduct the, the impact evaluation on the first years of the program from 97 to year 2000. And Michelle was part of that, isn't it? Um, some, of the, some of the things on the, on the, um, that are important, some issues that should be considered in the discussion of this, not recipe, but basic design, are uh, dealing with the institutional part of, of the programs, where which is the house, which agency, or in where to put this, the responsibility and, the, con and the, the, the direction of the program. Many of the countries have it in somehow presidential offices, and just a few of them, Equator, Mexico, um, Equator, Mexico, Jamaica, uh, and Brazil have it in the, in the ministry, or secretary, as we call them in Mexico. A second very important issue is what, what could be the way that health and education sectors and ministries and agencies are involved in the design process and in the decision-making process, because they are involved in the, in the services uh, provision. Of course, the clinics and the schools belong and are the responsibility of these ministries, but which can be their participation in the way to coordinate their efforts in the decision process and in the managing efforts to, to make the program work. And exactly dealing with that, what could be the role of the coordinating agency and the way, the tools to coordinate. Coordination in government, it's a very complex thing, not only dealing with politics, but, but also with um, the design, the architecture of the, the ministries, uh, health and education in most of our countries are huge historic ministries. 
centuries, for hundreds of years at least, of history being uh, the responsible for health and education. And these programs are new ones and have a different approach. They come from the population side. They see the poor people. They try to, to focus, to target on, on part of the population and on all, not all of it. And dealing with socioeconomic variables, not health or education variables, although they are linked. So this is a key question. Um, Although there is a literature now growing about these called CCTs, conditional gas transfers, it's important to note that although they are similar, they are not the same. And in this kind of, of programs, in this kind of efforts dealing with social development policies and social actions, details are really important. The key factors, the are for policy makers, of course, but also for research are, are important. So one, just one thing that's important, I think, it's scale and reach. Is this a national program or this is a small program, one more of the programs of the countries? The programs could grow slowly. In, in the case of Mexico, for example, to reach its, act, its current coverage of 5 million households, almost 25% of the population, and almost every household below the poverty line, it took seven years. It was not made in one or two years. Brazil was quicker, but they um, merged two big programs and they create Bolsa Familia from um, the merging of Bolsa Escola and Cartao Alimentação, the, the card for, for food. So uh, now they have one 11 million families in the program that would be more or less 30% uh, of their population. El Bono de Desarrollo Humano from Equator is also an example. It's, it goes over the poverty line and, and it reaches 30% of the population. So it's in proportionally, it's a bigger program in, in, in our continent uh, in Ecuador. Uh, Jamaica, it's all over the country, but has a top of coverage of ha almost half of the population in poverty, below poverty line, 230,000 230, persons, means more or less half of the, of the persons that live below the poverty line in Jamaica. Red Solidaridad El Salvador has been growing. I don't know if 48,000 is the, is the current number. It was at the, at the beginning of the year, but they are, they are growing, but they are only in almost fifth part of the municipalities, of the territory. And this geographical uh, targeting is important to, to understand because uh, the design of the targeting mechanism that we used in Mexico before used geographical targeting only to prioritize the coverage growth, only to make the priority list where to grow the coverage, not where that the program could work. It's a different thing. So geographical targeting is very useful to start with the most um, marginalized places where the poor people is the majority of the population, the, the poor families. So it's, it's very useful operationally, but we think, I think it should not be used as a, an exclusion mechanism. Programs that only work in some parts of the geography because they concentrate poverty and leave other similar condition households living in poverty outside the program because they live in the wrong place, urban places or not so uh, poverty concentrated areas. Also the benefits are different. There's a lot of discussion how to set the benefits and it's important to know that the, the, this is a, a key issue. It always is a discussion of fiscal space and resources available for these kind of programs. But uh, it's important to know how much of the resources are going. Some tend to say that these are um, expensive programs that they consume a lot of resources. But you should know that for Brazil and Mexico, the biggest one, ones in coverage in millions of families, the, the budget of, of the programs of Bolsa Familia and Oportunidades means 0.3 of the Producto Interno Bruto, income, gross product? GDP. GDP, GDP, that's it. 
GDP. Thank you. <laughs> uh, point three. And doesn't represents more than four or five percent of the whole social aggregated social budget, including social social security and all other education, health, and other programs. So, <coughs> in the case of Mexico, we're sp and, and also of Brazil, we are speaking about three U.S. billion dollars, more or less, a little more, in in budget, but. That's a proportion, and it's important to know. And the, the, the benefits are different. The, as you see, Bolsa Familia with the same budget supports 11 million families, than Mexico supports 5 million families with the same amount, three US billion dollars. There are different also in the mechanisms of targeting. PMT means proximate test, or so a way of objective select r rigorous targeting or declared income, that's Brazil. Eligibility is also uh, an issue. In most of the programs, eligibility means living below the poverty line and families with children. In the case of Mexico, it's just, it's for every household, independently of its demographic composition, if you have <coughs> children or not in the family, uh, below the poverty line. And this is important to, because the programs has also an effect of social safety in it somehow. It's not their main uh, um, goal, but they have some of this um, effect. The cash transfer composition, one component, just one uh, amount of money uh, as cash transfer, or several components like in Mexico, um, Colombia, El Salvador, that has the cash transfer dealing with health conditionalities and the cash transfer dealing with education conditionalities, and also the difference in, in the variability of the amount. And this is important because the cost of opportunity of education grows as the age of children goes up, grows. Um, which kind of education they target? Many programs only have coverage for primary education. That could mean six years of education. Some of them has uh, supports, gift cash transfers to children attending primary and then two or three more years of a secondary education. The case of Mexico is the, the most uh, comprehensive one. It supports till grade 12. That would be like high school or pre-college education. Um, and when the cash transfer is updated, if it's a discretionary decision of its, of, it, of its ruled or indexed. Also in operation, some of the programs are decentralized, uh, like Brazil, that the municipalities, the municipalities uh, the, uh, have, the, have the responsibility, or as in Mexico, that the central national government, what we call the federal government, is in charge of the program. Also, if the registry of beneficiaries pre-exist, like in Colombia, or has to be created through the program, like in Brazil and, and Mexico, and if it's a responsibility of a different agency than that of the program, that's the case of Colombia, of Chile, of República Dominicana, or if it's the responsibility of the same agency in charge of the program, like, like in Mexico, El Salvador, and other uh, countries. The thing of the house of the program, and also if the compliance of conditionalities is verified, if, the, if, the, if this part of the of the pact between the citizens and the, and the government, if, if it's enforced, if it's verified, most of the programs um, work like a payroll. They verify the compliance, and then with that information, the um, they estimate and deliver the, the cash transfers. And also if there are strong or weak monitoring systems and fraud prevention mechanisms. Some relevant features of, of Mexican program Oportunidades, I have been saying before, uh, it targets poor households with or without children. Uh, this is a, a figure that is not very well known. 40% of the beneficiaries of Oportunidades don't get an education transfer. They only get the basic cash transfer that it's amount uh, $22 now. So there's also this part of the interinstitutional coordination. It's very important in the consideration of the, of the program is that 
it's housed, it's in the agency is part of the social development ministry, but the board, the directive, uh, the governing body of the program is interministerial, intersectorial, health, uh, education, finance, Hacienda in the case of Mexico, are part of the junta of the consejo, the board, and it's of ministers. That is not a frequent meeting, but the, the, the next level, the deputy ministers meet at least uh, six times a year, almost uh, every two months. And there's an, a specialized agency, the National Coordination, which I was, I had the privilege to serve as national coordinator that has its autonomy, its uh, administrative and technical autonomy to deal with the, with the program. And this is very important because this level of coordination is needed in order that the part of the day-to-day -day or month-to-month, -month, let's say, uh, work coordinating efforts in order to know, to verify the compliance of conditionalities. Every two months, national coordination has to deliver in paper formats of the lists of beneficiaries to every school and to every health unit in order to, to get the information of the compliance. And it's paper because we have not the, the health units in the rural sector and the schools in, the, in most of our country are not online. So it's a, it's a logistic process. It's a very complex one. Uh, many people tend to say this is very expensive, but you should know that the total cost of the, of the administrative part of the program, including this and everything else, evaluation included, targeting mechanism, operations, that means surveying, et cetera, cost no more than 5% of the whole budget. So it's a good benchmark as we know it in, in other programs. Um, and the variability of the, of the cash transfer is a feature that's very important. Um, most of the, pro of the programs have a set amount as educational cash transfer. If the kid is attending a school, boy or girl, they get a cash transfer. Most of the countries also give a whole amount for one, two, three, or whatever number of kids are in the family. What Oportunidades does is give a specific amount to every specific uh, boy or girl attending school from third grade to 12th grade and has a, a, a gender positive discrimination starting on secondary because in Mexico, in the average, girls attend more school after uh, 10th grade, but that's the average. In the poor sectors, boys attend more because families tend to give the opportunity for several child to the man, to the boy, rather than, than, than women, rather than the girls. So Oportunidades makes this difference that is symbolic but important. It would amount 10 US at the last grade. Uh, for girls attending secondary education starting seventh grade in the, in the transition from primary to secondary, as we call it in Mexico. So every family gets a different amount depending on the grade, gender, and number of children attending school with a, with a base of 22 US as base for every household in the program. The main thing that is beyond the, behind this is that the cost of opportunity and the curve of attendance to school has a clear descent uh, in the transition from sixth grade to secondary. Here you have the grades. Here you have the curve of attendance for the poorest households. This is not the national figure. It's almost a very near 100. This is, well, more or less. It's 95 percent, 95%, 100, 95%. And here you can find the first turnout, the first caída, the first fell of the, of the curve. And then you have here another one. And this is the transition to the, what we call high school, media superior, uh, upper secondary would, would be a name. So the cash transfers have this uh, increase in the transition from sixth grade to secondary, and this increase in the transition from secondary to upper secondary or high school. So this is the design feature of the program. But it also has incorporated a, a cap 
at the top of the mountain. You don't want to um, disincentivize uh, own income. So it, there's a top. If there are many children and they are in upper grades, they could get a proportion of this. But it's clear that the family and every student, boy or girl in the family, is, uh, has the incentive to keep on going on school. And this has been evaluated, and it has had a very interesting impacts in evaluation. The main investment of Oportunidades program in Mexico is on education. <coughs> but as we're speaking here of health, let me go to, to health. Education meaning more enrollment, more attendance, more advancement, best uh, rate of transition from primary to secondary, and more impacts for girls attending school in the upper grades, in secondary and, and upper secondary. So in education, we have a very interesting uh, outcomes and impacts in nutrition. This is a study that was published by Dr. Juan Rivera in, in the JAMA, in the Journal of American Medicine. And uh, it shows in, in, a, clear, in a rigorous uh, experimental evaluation how um, the children uh, six months to two years increase their height, that it's a very important measurement to reduce stunting, um, increase their height when they are in the program compared to children in similar conditions outside the program. This was made in the first years of the program when the program hasn't the general coverage, so a control group for comparison could, could be uh, used because the program was growing and, and then not every family in had the, the program. And this is not an evaluation, this is the national figures for, for mal desnutrición crónica, for chronic malnutrition, uh, particularly for low height for the age. And this is how in national nutrition surveys it, it's been slowly reducing. The first slow, both are five po percentage points, but one was achieved in 11 years and the other one in seven years. This is a national figure, but the, the survey has the way to, to measure this according to socioeconomic conditions. And the result, the five points are concentrated, the reduction in the highest parts, but they, the, the deciles with less, the poorest deciles of the, of the population. Uh, 16 points in the first decile, 23 points and seven on the second decile. So the 20th, the first quintile, the 20th percent of the poorest population in Mexico had uh, a very important decrease, although it's high um, in, in malnutrition, in chronic malnutrition, and there's no difference here. So the, this is the, the part, and the difference in Mexico between 1988 and 1999, compared to 1999, 2006, when the surveys were um, made, um, is opportunidades. The difference is that. The, it's important to say that the, the, the budget for, for food programs was the same. But food programs in, in before Oportunidades were programs <coughs> in kind that had not uh, no effect in reducing malnutrition. Other examples of, of health impacts could be a clearly uh, increase the use of public sector health services, especially in rural areas, um, especially for preventive health. Uh, interventions that are really important. And there is a measurement of the decrease in the number of days sick for adults in the program compared to those outside the program. So what's the, the features that may explain some, some, some of these results, some of these impacts? Um, I would like to share with you some views of this. CCTs are demand-driven programs. They give incentives for people to use a service. So many this uh, policy makers and these um, 
tend to see that as the health units are a responsibility of the health ministry, that is not part of the program. And that's correct, that the health units are part of the ministries and the provision of the service is not part of the program. But the interaction between supply and demand is not mechanical, as this is not a market, <laughs> so it should be coordinated. The supply side, therefore, should be part of the, of the program, and it should be coordinated, coordinated in every detail. Um, my experience now is, is, is trying to advise uh, governments in, in Guatemala and in Peru to find a way to, to do this coordination based on the Mexican experience. So the, the health and nutrition interventions, although are established by the health ministry, are part of the rules of operation, part of the enforced rule of operations of the program. The, the package of intervention, its uh, regularity, its, timely, its timeliness, it's part of the rules. Um, so this package of intervention, this list of what people may get, what people may get from when they attend these health units, should be clearly established in a pro by priorities dealing with the morbidity, the most frequent diseases of uh, this kind of population. And it could be uh, preventive health care. So it's very important. Mexico has almost 100% of vaccination and almost 90 or 85% of timely vaccination. So that's, that has been achieved before. But other, the prevention of, of, of malnutrition, of stunting, the, the, um, the prevention, and this very related, of what they call iras anedas, diarrheic ep episodes and respiratory diseases or infections, um, the prevention of those and the treatment of those uh, are important part of this uh, package of health interventions. Um, and in the case of Mexico, these interventions are aligned to a lifeline cycle. They are not only, they are focused on small children, the early childhood, zero to five, especially zero to three years, uh, pregnant women and lactating mothers. There's a lot of things there, there are a lot of interventions there, but the package includes um, prevention healthcare measures for every member of the family according to their age, gender, condition, especially to prevent chronic diseases. And, and for example, one thing that is interesting is that the, this package in the poorest areas of Mexico includes uh, timely detection of cervix and mammal cancer for women that because that's one of the main causes of, of death for um, women in, in the age of 20 to 40. So um, these kind of, of actions are, are promoted. And what the program does is to get people in the health unit. So the, the, the challenge is that the, the health unit and the health sector and health workers may deliver uh, with quality, the services and the interventions. And also it has a, a feature of platicas that, well, this has not been evaluated very deep, but it's important because they are orientation, orientation stations, education for healthcare, for self-healthcare. And in these kind of conditions, this is very important because management of water, management of waste, taking care of washing hands before preparing food and this, everything, it's very important. And this is promoted uh, permanently through these platicas to these education sessions that have been transformed to workshops in the rules and are slowly transforming to workshops in the, in the actual practice. Okay, I'm concluding. Um, there's a discussion if this is the state-of-the-art way of doing things. My vision is that any discussion dealing with magic bullets is it's not appropriate. There are no such things in the social area or in any, as I know. So this kind of programs may or not be a best practice. It depends. First of all, the problem. 
the, the basics. What's the problem to solve? Is there a barrier related to income and socioeconomic conditions for the poor to get to the services, or is that there are no services? It's a different problem. So CCT work because they uh, push the demand and they get people to the schools and to the health units, but the schools and health units must be there previously or something should be taken care in order that they are in place to, to receive these uh, children especially and these families. So um, also there's a, a fiscal and policy decision uh, in some of the in Mexico the case was that unaffected programs were slowly um, phased out because of the growth of Progresa and Oportunidades, slowly and parallel, in the, not in the same coordination and not through the same agency and not in the same time exactly. But the final result was general subsidies for food and targeted food programs with a lot of subsidies have been phased out, well, where <laughs> now they are growing again. Um, with the um, creation and the growth of coverage of opportunities. And that's a, um, a sound way of using resources, scare resources for the social areas, transferring ones from unaffected programs and subsidies, um, unefficient subsidies, to um, these kind of programs that have better targeting and have a, an investment on future income on human capital accumulation. Okay, th my, my, final, my final remark deals with the conditionality um, concept. In, in Mexico, we prefer <coughs> talking about corresponsabilidad, shared responsibility. We don't use, and um, they don't use now, the conditionality. And this is important, we think, more beyond semantics because it means that there is a shared responsibility. There's a responsibility of the families to comply, attendance to health units, and sending their kids to school, and trying to uh, use the resources for their own good, and for health, and for education, and for food. But there's a responsibility of government, not only about delivering the cash transfer, but about giving the actual health and education services. And this is key in the discussion now about uh, these kind of programs in the world. Because what I've learned all these years in Mexico and now visiting other countries is that setting a targeting mechanism and finding a good paging agency is feasible to our countries. Delivering good health services and good schools to the poorest areas is not a, a, an easy task and needs a real commitment from the top level of the government, from the top of the government, to, and of course from the health and education um, heads, ministers themselves. themselves. So uh, it's very important uh, to, to try to switch to the corresponsabilidades language in order to emphasize that we're not conditioning citizens. We are, the government should guarantee rights. This is a way, this is a tool to make effective and actual the right for health and the right for education. Because the barrier that stop persons in, in poor families, children in these families that drop out earlier or doesn't attend uh, health units when they are uh, sane, when they are healthy, or they don't know they, are, they, are, they have, for example, chronic malnutrition, it's an economic barrier. It's a socioeconomic thing. It, it deals with a lot of, of conditions of the, of the way they were born. It's a matter of where you, they were born that make the difference in the kind of a school and the kind of health unit that they could attend. And so it's very important to say that this is shared responsibility and that the conditioning is for the government also. Government is conditioned to deliver in order to comply with the health and education human right. So, the, uh, but the, it, it must be said that the agency in charge of the program hasn't the tools 
to modify the quality of the education. At least we haven't found how, how this can be done because you can give that so much power to one agency and one one person, the health ministries and the, and the education ministries wouldn't allow that. So it's a, a very complex thing. In Mexico, ver several things have been tried. We have had it's a glass that could be seen half empty or half full because some things have been done and it's not so bad, but it could be better. Really, it could be better. And in other countries, the, the gap is, is bigger. So my, my conclusion is that uh, the politician like the cash transfer part. It's good to, to have a, a safety net for the good reasons, a safety net, a way to approach the, the poorest families. But the transparency, the accountability, and the responsibility for giving quality in health and education, it's more complicated. Thank you very much. I'm going to tell you about a much smaller CCT uh, based in New York City, which is called the Family Rewards Program. And uh, this is one of a number of uh, innovative uh, programs to, uh, to address uh, problems of poverty in New York City that uh, has, has been established by uh, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, it's one of his uh, signature innovation programs, gotten quite a bit of attention, but it's a small pilot. Uh, it's being intensively evaluated, um, and uh, we're still in the early stages of it, so I don't have results to share with you in terms of the effects on health outcomes or other outcomes, but I can tell you about the design of the intervention, a little bit about the early operating experiences, and uh, what we uh, are poised to learn. So let me begin by giving you a little bit of an overview. Um, like other CCT programs, this is envisioned as a two-generation intervention, one that will both try to uh, transfer cash to reduce immediate hardship for families who are in poverty, but do so in a way that also helps build human capital so that the chances of escaping poverty in the future for both the uh, current generation and the next generation um, are reduced. Uh, it was directly inspired by the Mexican uh, experience, and Mayor Bloomberg even went to Mexico to visit Oportunidades, uh, and I was on that trip as well, and it was very inspiring to see what had been uh, constructed and, and uh, to see some of the responses of the families who are being helped by this important program. Um, but in New York City, um, and, and in the US, of course, the idea of mutual, or of co-responsibility, mutual, mutual obligation is not a brand new one. It was, uh, it's been part of uh, the, the vision of welfare reform for uh, several decades now. We call it something else. We tended to call it uh, mutual obligation. And it's a principle that is uh, a core feature of our welfare system today, the, the TANF program, the AFDC, C program previously, and even the earned income tax credit. But in those systems, the condition is work. You need to make an effort to look for work in order to get your full cash transfer system. So there are elements of the CCT, uh, we never called it that, but elements of it um, uh, in, in welfare, our welfare uh, uh, programs uh, for many years. Uh, the New York City Family Rewards Program, though, is uh, a new cash transfer that is layered on top of a very extensive uh, existing uh, safety net, which uh, is, in that sense is quite different from Mexico. Um, so, so families get new money for making certain kinds of efforts or achieving certain kinds of outcome, outcomes, and it doesn't affect any of their other uh, cash transfers they get through the welfare system or through the earn, uh, earned income tax credit or other kinds of benefits such as food stamps and, and so forth. Uh, just a word on the uh, uh, partnership that's operating this project and designed it. Um, 
The overall leadership is provided by the Mayor's Center of Economic Opportunity uh, and uh, under the, the general responsibility of uh, Deputy Mayor Linda Gibbs, um, for whom I'm substituting today. Uh, and it's supported by private foundations, a design team made up of my organization, MDRC, which is a research organization, uh, uh, an organization called CEDCO, which is an intermediary social services organization, and staff from the Senior Center of Economic Opportunity, consulting with other experts inside and outside of government, actually designed the intervention. Uh, MDRC is carrying out the uh, evaluation, and CEDCO uh, is carrying out the, uh, the actual operations of the program in partnership with uh, six community-based organizations. Um, also, it's an entirely privately funded, funded initiative because it, it is so controversial, the idea of paying uh, families to do some of the uh, kinds of activities that I'll, I'll mention has really riled up both the left and the right. Mayor Bloomberg realized there'd be no way to do this, uh, uh, get a, get a um, grant from or a, a budget passed by the city council to actually fund this. Um, so it's a, it's a trial, it's a pilot, and uh, we're poised to learn a lot from it. Now, who's it targeted toward? Here, the, what we did was identify uh, six of the uh, highest poverty community districts in New York City, and within those districts, decide to target the program on families who had incomes within 130% of the poverty line, the federal poverty line. So very low income families, especially uh, in New York City, where the cost of living is so high. Um, and as an indicator of families' incomes, we used uh, uh, information that indicated whether the family's children were enrolled in the uh, free school lunch program because it sets its eligibility level at 130% uh, of the poverty line. Uh, and we also identified families who had a child in the fourth, s seventh, or ninth grade because we wanted to make sure we had sample sizes large enough uh, for the research down the road with children who were at at um, critical transition stages in the education system. Uh, we recruited families from lists provided by the uh, New York City Department of Education, and we provided those lists to the uh, local organizations, the community-based organizations. We call them NPOs or neighbor neighborhood partner organizations. Uh, they took those lists and they uh, sent mailings, made phone calls, and if couldn't contact people, um, they, you know, went to their their homes or neighbors and, and tried to track them down to get them to enroll in the program. We tried very hard to get a real cross section of the eligible population. Ultimately, it was a voluntary program. People had to come in and sign a an, an informed consent form, and they were then randomly allocated to a program group or uh, the control group. Overall, the, um, the we have about 5,000 families in the uh, study, about half in the program, half in the control group, and 5,750 families in the program group, and, and the same number, almost 11,000 in total uh, children in the overall evaluation. Um, here's how uh, we set payments. Um, these were kind of general principles in deciding how much money to allocate on what for what kinds of activities. And uh, generally speaking, there was a mix of payments tied to inputs, efforts that keep that people could make, but also in some cases, um, some outcomes that they might achieve. And and there was no real scientific uh, guidance available for us to decide how much money should be given for various activities. So it really was an informed uh, judgment. Um, Generally speaking, there was more money attached to what were perceived to be harder outcomes to achieve. Uh, we did, unlike Mexico and, and other uh, places in the international community, we have attached some uh, rewards for performance on standardized tests, and there was um, a lot of debate over how high those should be, uh, and, and it was important to try to balance the incentive value of the offer, having a big uh, um, offer that would uh, attract a lot of attention and maybe stimulate uh, um, effort with the uh, potential downside uh, for children, which is putting too much pressure on them to perform well on a very high stakes test, and that could have some very negative effects. 
Um, and you know, generally speaking, we have a long list, as you'll see, of different types of activities that draw down different types of rewards. And that's good on the one hand, because it gives families more opportunities to earn, and, and it, it, it addresses that kind of cash transfer function, immediate hardship reduction, gets hands in the, it gets money in the hands of poor people quickly. On the other hand, it's a much more complex program, and you have to worry about what families actually uh, understand and how they might be responding to it. Uh, uh, we decided that the, the total amount of money uh, that was being transferred had to be substantial, and if families generally met all of the conditions uh, that, that would draw down rewards, they could make between four and six uh, thousand dollars. But it really depended on how many rewards they, I mean, how many conditions they met, and how large the family was. If they have a large family with all the kids obeying and doing what they should be doing, they can uh, actually make much more than this. Uh, the incentives are available for two and we hope three years, that depends on funding, uh, but the evaluation effort itself will continue for at least five years. Uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to uh, walk you through, not without taking too much time in the education ones, uh, what, the, what the incentive schedule actually is. And it differs a little bit by uh, level of schooling. So in elementary and middle school, there's a set of rewards for effort, as you can see here, from attendance uh, to parent-teacher conferences, uh, parents talking about the annual tests that their kids take uh, with their teachers, and a, a one-time uh, reward for getting a library card, which you hope will get uh, families using a, uh, an important local resource. And the amount varies, uh, but these are uh, smaller payments. The bigger payment is on the annual standardized test. And uh, for a child who scores uh, at a proficiency level uh, or above or makes progress toward a proficiency level uh, from one year to the next, there's a $300 payment for the English portion of the test and a uh, $300 payment for the math portion, so 600 in total, a little bit higher for middle school students. And all these payments go to the parents, so it's really important to recognize that uh, this is an incentive that's really about parental engagement. If the parents never tell the kids that the family's getting these rewards based on their efforts, uh, at least partly, uh, the child won't even know he or she's in a program. So uh, a lot of uh, what this is trying to do is uh, influence how parents engage in their kids' um, education. At the high school level, uh, similar concept of rewarding uh, effort and achievement. What's different on the achievement side particularly is that high school students don't take stand the usual standardized tests, but in New York City they have to pass five regents exams, which are subject area um, achievement tests in order, to, uh, in order to graduate from high school. So there's an award attached to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, th they also need 44 credits in order to graduate, and to graduate on time, you need to accumulate at least 11 per year, so there's a reward that uh, tries to encourage that, and then the, finally a, a, a re reward at graduation. And here, um, half or, or a portion of the money is paid to the parents, and a portion of the money is actually paid to the teenager. So um, the teenagers actually have uh, you know, resources based on their school efforts and performance that they control. Now in the health sector, um, the, in, the focus is entirely on preventive health care. And here we focus uh, partly on uh, health insurance and also health-related uh, physician visits and dental visits. For health insurance, most of the families, because they are poor, are eligible and most are actually receiving uh, some kind of subsidized health care, Medicaid or um, they're participating in the in, in other the the S chip programs, the state child health uh, subsidy programs. Um, but one of the problems is that families have to, because it's an income based uh, program, have to continue to reestablish their eligibility for those programs. They have to show every year that their income uh, hasn't changed to the point that they'd become ineligible. And there's a lot of churning on the rolls. Families don't keep their uh, their eligibility up to date. They lose touch with the agency. They go for some time without, uh, without health care, and some never come back and reapply. Um, 
with health insurance. So there's an incentive here to maintain coverage all the time. Um, and coverage for yourself if you're eligible as an adult, but also for your children. And for families who may not be eligible, may have taken a job and uh, get health care through an employer, but where they'd be required to pay a, a, co a premium copay, uh, there's an incentive, it's actually $50 a month to um, maintain that insurance. And, and, and that money actually may be used to help make the co-payment. Um, so maintaining health insurance because uh, presumably that'll uh, make sure people are getting care they need when they need it. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a focus on, uh, and this is directly inspired by Opportunidades, uh, maintaining uh, annual health care or, or, or making sure you get, everyone in the family gets annual health care visits. So you, as you can see here, an annual health care visit for one person in the family would earn a $200 payment. If the, um, if the doctor identifies a problem that requires follow-up, there's also an, a, an, an incentive payment of half that, the $200 amount for the family to follow through within the designated time period. So if the doctor says come back in six months, the family has to show evidence that they've done that and they can earn this additional, um, this additional incentive. And for families with very young children, uh, New York City actually has a, um, a universally available early childhood uh, development screening program. So if your physician identifies some sort of de early developmental problems and suspicious your child may have a, you know, a, a problem, um, you can re request uh, a free screening where the, the another agency will send someone to your home and do a thorough all-day um, assessment. I don't know if it's all-day really, but a th very thorough assessment. It's a program that middle class families use quite heavily and this is an effort to uh, bring its, uh, this opportunity to the attention of uh, lower income families and encourage them to take advantage of it if their doctor uh, indicates a problem. And finally, the, well, before I go on, well, finally, um, is an emphasis on uh, dental care. Uh, this is often neglected. Actually, it's, it's a real problem. There's just a story in CNN the other day about how many families across the country are having difficulty, low-income families, um, uh, getting dental care because uh, dentists will typically not take uh, Medicaid. Um, and, and so it requires more effort to find a, do a dentist who will or, or to find a free clinic or a lower income clinic. But we thought this was very important given um, how many dental problems go undetected among low income families and the importance of trying to intervene with them uh, early on. So there are payments to encourage parents to, to go to the dentist, take their kids to the dentist, and, um, uh, and, ho and, and establish that relationship and, and get that needed care. Um, and it may mean that they, they do have to spend the extra effort to find a dentist who will treat them. Um, one other thing to mention about the, the health care in general is that um, while we've uh, created an incentive to go to the doctor, we cannot, as, as was mentioned earlier, we, we could not control the quality of the delivery of the service. And you always worry, of course, that many low-income families will end up going through Medicaid mills and not getting proper treatment. So one effort we've, we made uh, was to design a particular uh, health care checklist. Uh, and we designed this with some phys physician advice and uh, uh, advice from staff in the New York City Department of Health. It's a checklist that tries to steer the doctor uh, to doing and checking off that uh, he or she's actually done age-appropriate and gender-appropriate screenings for each family member. And the doctor actually has to sign that form and put down uh, their license number, um, and uh, that's what gets, submit gets submitted as evidence. So it's not a lot of control, of course, but it is some attempt to try to um, push the push on the quality side as as much as we thought we could. Um, the third major domain, and last major domain, is um, focused on mm -hmm, is focused on employment. 
And unlike uh, most of the CCTs operating in other countries, here there's a financial incentive to uh, encourage families to sustain full-time work or to try to build human capital by taking on um, training while working. And this is focused just toward, uh, this targeted just toward the parents in the family. And uh, again, the, the idea is here, the, is the CCT is, a, in this case, a short-term transitional opportunity, but if uh, families are going to uh, really move out of poverty, work has to be part of the equation, and this is an attempt to help move them in that direction. Um, quickly on the program delivery, I mentioned that uh, CEDCO, an intermediary organization, non-profit non organization, um, oversees overall implementation, and it's their job to function as a, a marketing agency that inf explains and informs uh, participants about the incentives, uh, to process claims that people are making, and to authorize the payments that get made to families. And then they work with these six neighborhood partner organizations which function as a human face within the local community. So if families have uh, questions about the program or about the incentives and sometimes about their claims, there's a, a person they can see face to face. And that's important because this is a program that has no case management by design. But it was unexpected that families needed some uh, additional support. Um, I'm going to skip those. Uh, and just say a little bit about the first year accomplishments. Uh, enrollment into the program occurred last summer and was really time to, to begin with the beginning of the school year last September. So we're just uh, finishing up the, the first uh, school year anyway. And I can talk about more about this later, but quite a bit has been accomplished in getting this very complicated program in place up and running during the first year. Um, and many families are now earning rewards. In fact, almost everyone's earned at least uh, some rewards, and probably uh, about 61% have been paid in every activity period. An activity period is a two-month period uh, during which the activities occur, and then families get in the subsequent, uh, subsequent period a payment for, for what they accomplished in that activity period. So some families are sustained um, earners in that sense. And the amount of money is, uh, is substantial. Uh, if you look in the yellow slice of this pie, you can see only about a quarter um, earned during uh, that first period through June, less than $1,200. Uh, in fact, if you look at the blue uh, slice, you can see that another quarter earned over $3,600 uh, in that time period. Um, and the average is about $2,600 for a family so far. And interestingly, um, uh, over five and a half million dollars has been paid so far, and about 36% of that money has gone toward uh, claims in the, in the uh, health sector. Um, it's a very comprehensive uh, evaluation plan where we'll look at the operations of the program, its effects on a whole variety of outcomes using administrative records data as well as survey data with the families, do a cost-benefit analysis, and try to uh, continue this at least for five years, which will um, give us at least two years after the incentives end to see whether any positive effects the program may have generated are sustained um, or whether they begin to dissipate once the incentives are withdrawn. And finally, um, this is again just an evaluation of a pilot. The, uh, the intention of the Mayor's Center for Economic Opportunity is eventually, if the evidence is positive, to um, try to uh, put this into policy. Doing so, of course, it would be very expensive for New York City at any sizable scale, so you'd need to get some federal funding for it. Um, and of course, in making the case for, for federal funding, it's not compelling enough to say you did it in New York City, you have to do it in you know, places like Arkansas and other, other places around the country. So we're beginning to talk to other communities about uh, the possibility of expanding the trial to see if we can get broader evidence and and any evidence that if there are positive effects, they, um, they can be achieved elsewhere. Thank you.
I'm not going to be talking in depth about one particular program. I'm going to rather talk about a range of issues and results from a number of different programs. I won't say too much about how CCTs can improve health because I think Rogelio has covered that quite well, although I might elaborate on a couple of points. Uh, I'll give an example of, of what a uh, health service package looks like that I think is an interesting example um, of so some work that I was doing in, Sal in El Salvador. Talk about evaluation methods, give some additional impacts on programs in Latin America and Turkey that um, I've worked on. I won't be including Mexico because Rogelio um, presented uh, many of those. And then I hope to spend as much time as possible on the, what I'm calling future challenges and knowledge gaps. That's one of the things I was asking, asked to speak about and something I have a lot to say on. So hopefully I'll leave myself time to get to it. So Rogelio already talked about uh, the different ways in which CCTs can contribute to improved health through the demand side, the increased participation in services, through the health sector strengthening. Uh, one point I might just uh, say a little bit more about is on uh, new infrastructure programs that are not part of the CCT necessarily, but in El Salvador, for example, are being implemented as part of the broader program called Red Solidaria, and the theory being that if roads are improved, if water and sanitation and electricity services are improved that that in the clinics, for example, as well as in the home, that that will have dire uh, direct impacts on health participation as well as health impacts at the household level. Um, Rogelio talked about the health and nutrition training workshops and the importance of those. I've listed some of the different areas that those uh, that, that training takes place in. Uh, one of the things that some programs are using in El Salvador, again, I may keep bringing that up because I just got back last night from a couple of weeks working with the CCT program in El Salvador, they have home visits for training. So it, happen, it occurs not only in workshops, but they have health uh, service providers regularly visiting people's homes and dealing with a range of um, health issues, nutrition, and child care issues. Uh, the other way in which CCTs aim to directly contribute or have the potential to contribute to improved health is through what's usually referred to as women's empowerment, and that incurs through a number of different mechanisms. One is that the benefic benefit goes directly to the woman normally, um, and there is a great a large body of evidence by now showing that the money that gets into the hands of women tends to be spent on uh, children's need basic needs more than the same amount of money going to men. And then the direct participation training in some programs in collective organization of women. And then these programs and all the ones I've worked in, well actually with one notable exception, um, gender discourse becomes a large po uh, part of what occurs within communities um, in Mexico, Nicaragua, those were very significant. Uh, in Turkey it didn't uh, take place and that's something that maybe I'll have time to come back to. Um, and then of course the larger objective is to, to uh, affect these interactions between nutrition, health, education, and poverty. There is an uh, enormous body of evidence by now showing how that poor and malnourished children tend to start, start school later or not go to school at all, that stunted children are more likely to have lower school achievement and performance, and that ultimately increases their wages and leads to an, uh, an ongoing cycle of poverty, and CCTs aim to um, break that cycle. Um, in El Salvador, the services for children from zero to five include growth monitoring and then re referral of uh, problematic cases, um, evaluation of child feeding practices, uh, micronutrient supplementation, in particular iron, zinc, vitamin A, uh, vaccinations, they evaluate psychomotor skills, uh, they look for disabilities, <coughs> anti-parasite treatments, and then dental care as well. And then for um, pre uh, women who are pregnant or just given birth, there's another whole set of, of um, services, and then they have all a whole other range of services that are done by age group from 5 to 10, 10 to 19, the 10 to 49, the fertile age, and 20 to 59, and then for the elderly, although the condition, the conditionalities only apply up to, um, well, age 14, that includes the school part of the program, but the services are available for everybody, and everybody's encouraged to participate whether or not you're in the program, and everybody in the rural areas, everybody has been targeted into the program except people that don't have children, and though they're the ones that um, hopefully will participate in the services despite the fact that there isn't um, any conditionality or cash attached to it. 
Um, so again, I talked about the home visits. Uh, they also have group-based training, similar uh, to what um, Rogelio talked about in Mexico. In El Salvador, it's not monitored. Uh, I mean, sorry, it is monitored. So they do actually have to put the stamp for participating in the training in their, um, their booklets, but it's not conditioned. But what's interesting there is that most people believe it is conditioned. And so that's something that we'll be looking at in the current evaluation to see what effect that, that has and sort of the perception of conditionality on participation in the, um, the health training. They have both uh, permanent and mobile health facilities, and in a country where there is a very serious lack of health service supplies, the mobile facilities are particularly important in the very poor, poor areas. Um, again, government does some of the services, but there's limited capacity, so the NGOs uh, contribute to the health service delivery. And then they also have a local participatory process of health risk ma mapping and prioritization of interventions. Now, this is all the design phase, and from what we've seen, that um, it looks like largely that is being implemented but it's very different across communities. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the evaluation methods that are used. Um, there are large-scale quantitative surveys that can be anywhere from, uh, there were about 1,000 households in our survey in Nicaragua, because that was a very small program, up to about 26,000 in the Progressa evaluation. Um, the best design is when they can, uh, the communities can be randomized, and you have a chance to look at uh, the effects before the program and after the program and with and without so that you can subtract out the effects that um, take place with the co uh, control group. And if you can analyze administrative data to compare to what the household reports, that is um, very, uh, very useful as well. Um, what is normally measured or can be measured uh, have to do with health center visits, child growth, particular micronutrient uh, deficiencies, and other things such as vaccinations, fertility, and so on. Um, Health-related related knowledge and practices uh, can be evaluated, but they're not evaluated as much as uh, would be, be useful. And then uh, service delivery is also evaluated in terms of health staff, uh, ratios between health staff and patients, um, availability of medication, the quality uh, of staff training. And then it's also important, if possible, to observe and practice, because uh, when you do an impact evaluation and you find a range of outcomes uh, on nutrition, for example, on iron or on um, growth, uh, uh, child growth that uh, may be very high or very low, often the explanation might be in the implementation. So um, what we sometimes do is we have people that are in the health uh, centers and observing whether or not, for example, the growth monitoring is taking place as it should, whether or not they might not give a vaccination because they have to have um, six people to use up the bottle, and so in some cases they might not want to open a bottle and that sort of thing. So it's important to see what actually happens. Um, we also use qualitative methods. We use ethnographic uh, household and community case studies where we have uh, young students, usually from those countries, are uh, living within the villages for, let's say, uh, four to six months. We'd love to do it for a year, but that's usually not possible. Um, key informant interviews and also intensive observations within households, clinics, markets, and program activities. Um, what the qualitative work studies is gender, uh, and a range of different social relations, with uh, often focusing on gender. Um, how sociocultural factors affect participation, because many of these programs depend on some kind of behavior change, and those can be very complex. And so it's important to understand how those are um, constraining participation and outcomes, and I'll give a few examples of that later on. Um, unintended impacts of the program, uh, strengths and weaknesses of institutional arrangements, because those will are, are um, essential, and Rogelio, I think, has already made that point very well. Um, again, similarly uh, with respect to program processes and operations, and then uh, political processes as well that might affect the program. So I'm going to give a few examples. Um, I think I might not spend too much time on this one. This is, uh, I've got some more depth on these, uh, some of these cases. This is the evaluation of the conditional cash transfer program in Nicaragua. Um, currently, um, it has been closed down, something we can maybe talk about later. But, um, but it was one of the, uh, I think, very high quality evaluation that was done um, largely by John Maluccio and Rafael Flores. Um, this shows the impact of the program on um, percent of children under five who had attended uh, uh, preventative growth monitoring. And this evaluation was done in two phases, and you can see between uh, 2000 and 2002 the difference between the, uh, the double difference estimate between the control and program group were 16 uh, percentage point in, uh, increase. And then between 2002 and 2004, 
Um, the blue represents the group that stayed in the program. The control group then was en uh, entered the program, and you can then see a 15 percentage point increase in the uh, the newly uh, the new entrance into the program, and then the new pro uh, control group again is um, shown in green. Um, this is impact on the percent of household budgets that were dedicated to different food groups and what you see there, um, or maybe you don't see it there, but uh, there was an increase in meat, in um, fruits, fruit and consumption of certain kinds of grains and um, a reduction in um, beans and, and cereals and um, that have the potential to contribute to uh, improved um, uh, nutritional impacts. Now, this was a um, analysis of the impact of uh, on anemia, and what it shows essentially is there was no impact. And what was curious about that was that uh, people reported very high rates of receiving the iron supplements uh, from their clinic visits, but and um, it's not entirely clear all of the factors that explain that. But from the ethnographic work we did, what we found was mothers were getting the iron, but often uh, were not actually giving them to the children, or the children didn't want to take them. There were many beliefs circulated that iron was bad for the stomach or hurt children's teeth, and um, but there's other possible theories as well that could be investigated. Um, there were efforts through um, these food fairs and through training to improve nutritional in intake uh, to uh, get people to consume new foods like soy products and green leafy vegetables, but it was very hard to get people to change their diet. It was easier to, uh, what the bigger effect comes from people eating more of foods that they're already um, uh, accustomed to, to, to consuming. Um, yeah. This is uh, some impacts uh, from the CCT program in Honduras, and I think I just want to use this to, to make illustrate one point in particular. This was a study that tried to separate out the independent effects of the demand supply interventions and the delivery of, of health services, improved delivery, and so the evaluation had a group that uh, received just, just the conditional cash transfer, um, improvements of supply along with in, uh, the demand side and supply only, and um, what it did show was that a high, high impact from the demand side, um, it didn't show much impact on the supply side, and it's too bad because it was basically what happened there was it was just very slow problems with implementation of the supply side, and so that opportunity was 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 lost. And I think that illustrates the importance of implementation issues to understanding ultimate impacts, but also that this sort of intervention um, should be designed again at a time when it works. Um, the uh, CCT evaluation that we did in Turkey didn't have too, there weren't too many health conditionalities and there weren't too many impacts, but basically there was um, a small impact on immunization um, uh, uh, in both different sort of research designs that we used for that. Um, some of the interesting uh, findings that we ha had with from the uh, ethnographic studies in Turkey um, wa uh, were that we and we did this in just three regions in in Turkey, and that showed that and this was the results from about 120 in-depth ca household case studies that people were more likely to use the health services for illness than prevention. That's um, not so surprising, but it's something that speaks to the design of the CCT program. There was quite a bit of, of res cultural resistance, especially in the southeastern, more conservative, socially conservative regions, the use of modern health services, um, problems with women going to male doctors, fear over vaccinations, and um, we also there were also communication um, problems around the conditionalities. Um, this is an example from research that we did on education in Turkey, and I, and I know we're talking about health here, but I think it does uh, illustrate a nice point about the social, the significance of the sociocultural issues. And um, this was again from about 120 uh, household case studies. And what we did is we tried to understand why weren't people sending their children to school in um, Van and Diyarbakir in the southeastern part of the country. Enrollment rates at the uh, secondary and the primary level were very low, um, despite the program. Um, um, and so we tried to, we looked at a range of issues of why people were not sending their children to school. And um, the first one is school expenses. You can see in all three of these regions that school, that money was very important in explaining uh, and explaining their edu decisions about education. And that is what the CCT directly goes to target. But look at the effects of other issues as well that the CCT doesn't necessarily deal with the gender issues. Um, you can see 100% of the families in that sample in Vaughan province talked about um, issues of honor, sexuality, reputation. Those were the main reasons that they wouldn't send their child to school and cash was not enough to compensate for that. Um, and then there's other issues about how people value education, um, opportunities that they see, um, and then issues around um, 
safety in children's own preferences for school. Children have what much more agency that was in, the, uh, in their own schooling decisions, even at a younger ages, and that was then something is normally anticipated in the context of a CCT design. Okay, I'm gonna um, use my remaining time to talk about um, what I see are future challenges and knowledge gaps. I wouldn't be a researcher if I didn't try to include the knowledge gaps. Um, most impacts currently in CCT evaluations are measuring uh, health visits, participation in growth monitoring, for example, participation in um, prenatal checkups, as opposed to outcomes. And there needs to be more focus on outcomes, including designing programs in a way that will lead to outcomes that can be measured and then designing that into the evaluation. Now, Mexico, I think, is, is one of the best examples where they actually have looked at a range of different uh, impacts on health outcomes as well. But um, um, some of the other CCTs are not doing that as much as they could. Um, more attention to how to increase nutrition as these programs move into Africa in particular. Um, they need, there's need for more focus on nutrition and how to increase the effectiveness of certain nutritional outcomes that are not being uh, affected as like iron or anemia, for example, um, as opposed to the reductions in um, stunting, which has the programs have been very successful at, um, at affecting. Uh, a better understanding of the pathways through which impacts take place. We know that they have an impact, but it has been very hard to separate out, and most of the evaluations haven't really managed to separate out yet. What is the effect of the conditionality? Would people, would you have the same effect if you didn't have it? Now, the three studies that I'm aware of in Latin America that have uh, looked at, have tried to compare uh, conditionality in Ecuador, Brazil, and Mexico have shown that on, at the in terms of education, the conditionality actually has a significant impact over just the transfer itself that wouldn't be conditioned. But um, but again, there, we haven't seen that in terms of health, and um, there needs to be broader, broader, broader understanding or studies of, of that particular question. Um, so is it the conditionality, or is it just giving the cash? Is it the effect of the, nutri uh, uh, the micronutrients? Is it the training? We don't know. We know that uh, you explained what happens in the training and why it's important, um, but we haven't actually been able to measure very well um, the effect of the training, or is it the supply, or, or is it the implementation of, uh, that actually ultimately affects the outcomes? Um, more attention to age patterns and service utilization. Why is it that some of the programs had more of an effect at the two to five, although the health impacts should in theory happen more at zero to two? Um, and just trying to uh, design the programs in such a way to, uh, to target uh, different particular outcomes and to better understand what those, um, the, what those pathways look like. Um, uh, cost effectiveness. We know that CCTs are um, effective, but compared to what? That might be a different sort of intervention that might be have achieve, trying to achieve certain outcomes and at what cost per, uh, per what kind of change. Um, what the size of transfer should be. Now, there has been a fair amount of work that's looked into that, but what do you do with, um, how do you adjust that, possibly for changing food prices, for example? Now, some of these issues, again, are, are as programs move into other regions of the world, world which I'll, I'll say more about um, in a minute. Um, issues around targeting, um, whether they should be, should be geographic or household, community-based seems to be the system that's being used in Africa, and how do you scale those up? Um, how do you design programs that, uh, that to avoid certain per perverse incentives? Now, um, there are some examples of this, um, not extensive, but uh, for example, in the, one of the earlier, uh, actually the evaluation that, that IFPRI did of the, uh, Mike, of the uh, um, nutrition CCT in Brazil, there was a reduction in um, weight gain and uh, theorized on uh, that possibly people were using strategies to try to keep their child under a certain level in order to be able to continue to receive the benefit. Um, in Nicaragua, we, we witnessed people giving their child a lot of food and water just before being weighed um, in order to, and that based on a belief that they would lose benefits um, if they didn't achieve weight gain. That was an early part of the design, but the government very quickly realized that that didn't, wasn't a, didn't make sense as a conditionality and changed that, but that belief continued. So that's another example. Um, some very small impact on fertility in Honduras um, that maybe increased fertility, but it's not clear whether that had to do with the program or increased rates of marriage or um, male presence, uh, but there was no impact or there was reduced fertility in Mexico, Nicaragua, Colombia, and Turkey. So the, uh, the possibility that people are going to get pregnant in order to get a benefit seems, um, is, looks like it's pretty low. Uh, another important issue is um, what's called sometimes graduation for the program. Um, how do you decide how long people stay in and when they should leave? Um, do you reassess? If you reassess them and take them out, that become when if they're no longer poor, that becomes less expensive for the program. But there's a certain level of insecurity in terms of, of commitment to the child's um, 
overall um, well-being over a period of time, so there's trade-offs with res regard to that. Um, that method, aging out, is a simpler way. When people pass a certain age, they no longer seem certain kinds of benefits. Um, they could then trans transition into the next stage. I think Mexico has probably has done the best job of that in, in looking at how different people at each stage of the life cycle should be protective. Um, could you possibly graduate them into productive activities where um, at a certain point they might be able to uh, benefit from um, uh, some kind of cash transfer that's used in a more uh, as for an investment. Um, the role of local organizations, social, social capital. Um, how much does a program depend on community level organizations, local leaders for different aspects of implementation? And I think that really depends on context. El Salvador has a very complex structure of municipal committees, of community-based committees, of local leaders, of NGOs, and they're all involved in different ways in the implementation um, and even the, cho the choice of some of the services. Um, Turkey, we it just isn't possible to do that for a number of reasons and I don't have time to talk about right now, but it just would be much more difficult. Um, just even convening groups of women in certain parts of the country is very difficult. So that would depend on context. Um, most of the, the programs in, um, in Latin America use a centralized system for um, poverty-based targeting using a proxy means test. And, uh, but as they're finding in Africa that that's going to be difficult, partly because people live very far away. It's, there's, there's administrative capacity issues and also there's just, they've just used community-based targeting for a long time. So it, it, there's um, might likely to be problems or they've run into some problems trying to do it other ways. And so they largely are depending on um, community-based methods. I think one of the main uh, new challenges, areas for future work is CCTs going to new uh, regional context, uh, particularly Asia and Africa. Um, how do you adapt them? Uh, how do you learn from the experience of Latin American countries without using a blueprint that might not be appropriate to these contexts? Um, Rogelio raised the point of under making sure, that understanding what the priority problems are in a country, um, and so and and that may look very different in Africa. Uh, and how do you then? And 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 so it's and it's not just what is the issue, but also uh, for whom? Um, where is it? Girls? Um, they, there may be gender discrimination. There may not. Um, maybe a lot of the source of a lot of the problems when you're working with HIV, HIV and AIDS have to do with um, men, male behavior. And so um, how do you look at a CCT that might uh, begin to address that? Um, what are the specific micronutrients that you're trying to target? Is it care? Um, and then what are the factors that are constraining those improvements? Um, is it cash? If it's cash, then the CCT can be very effective. If it's supply, then you need the supply side. But is it sociocultural? If it's largely that, then the cash may, or may not be enough. And so how do you structure those constitutionalities to respond? And um, I think that the gender issues are playing out in new ways in Africa, and I think that those are some things that really need to be front and center as these programs move. Um, one of the big debates in uh, Africa right now is whether to condition it all. Okay. Um, and uh, the largest uh, concern being supply and in, uh, of, of health services, of, of um, of um, schools and of administrative capacity, the ability to implement these fairly complex programs. And uh, there are pilots going on now comparing condition unconditioned transfers. So I think that that uh, question, hopefully, if they're well designed, will uh, be, will be able to begin to, to understand some of that better. But one of the things that they're doing right now is looking at soft conditionalities. In some cases, they waive them for somebody who's old and might not be elderly, might have trouble getting or might be living, um, getting to the health centers or might be living somewhere that is difficult uh, to reach. You've got a lot of children living with grannies and they may have a hard time um, getting to the, the health centers. Um, sometimes they, they has a, there's a strong discussion about conditionality, about expectations, but they're not actually um, enforced. And then uh, one of the things that I observed in, in El Salvador is the use of exceptions, attendance to individual cases, so case workers that will, individuals that will understand the conditions of different individuals in the community and understand if they had a good reason for not going. Um, challenges of the sociocultural barriers uh, to health service participation in well, as well. Generally, it seems to be easier to affect education outcomes and health outcomes of certain types. And so um, we need a better understanding of what those actual issues are that keep people from participating um, or keep the participation from having the outcomes intended, um, attention to beliefs and, and attitudes, not just of the adults who might be getting the cash, but of adolescents, and then what other sort of complementary approaches might be need, needed to uh, to begin to work, speak towards those sociocultural issues. Um, new 
new contexts and new program objectives. What we're seeing in some of the new programs in, um, in Africa and Asia, um, attention to early childhood development, a number of new pilots that are condition that have conditionalities or, uh, that are connected to uh, sexually transmitted infections uh, for testing for that and then ongoing counseling. Uh, in India, um, some work with trying to delay the age of marriage. Uh, savings accounts, that's something now five Latin American countries are, are beginning to uh, design programs where people have um, savings accounts that are part of the uh, new, new CCTs and to see whether or not they can, people can get more into um, that, that that can be successful. And then uh, programs that involve older children and adults, again, the, the STI work this tends to be aimed more at young adults. Um, the, both the Mexican and the New York cases are beginning to work with the older adolescents or high school age and um, and the new ch look, looking at the design features that, that speak to some of those particular challenges for those age working with those age groups. Um, in Africa, they're looking at, at um, linking complementary services, and again, some of the Latin American countries have done this as well. They're not conditionalities, but they are looking at ways in which social welfare services, um, health services, literacy, and productive activities can be, um, they can use the cash transfer as a way to facilitate participation, but it's not actually a condition part of the program. But while we can look at some of the potential and get excited about some of these uh, new areas that have a lot of, um, that, that have promise in terms of the within the structure of a conditional cash transfer program, um, you have to be really cautious not to overburden the systems. Um, some of the Latin American countries can get into some of these more complex designs because they've been at this for a while and because they've got the uh, financial resource and the administrative and technical capacities to be able to 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 um, to implement them. But I even a basic CCT can be fairly complicated for a very poor country with low capacity. They're not impossible. I think the cases of Nicaragua and Honduras show uh, ways in which NGOs can be brought in, which very low-income countries uh, can actually uh, be successful in implementing these, these these kinds of programs. And I think that does have have um, implications for their their possibilities in the African context. But. It makes sense to really look at the individual country uh, context and think about how do you phase these. Start out with a very simple program, then begin to introduce new elements as is possible. And then, of course, um, there are issues around um, financing and political sustainability. And um, here are some of the references for the impact results that I presented. Thanks. Okay, we've got some time for some questions. Uh, as I said earlier, just wait for a microphone, and I think we're gonna uh, take a few at a time so we can get through as much as we can. Let's start over back here. Uh, my name is Carlos Indacochea from uh, Population Action International. Um, I'm a bit concerned that um, given that uh, there's reasonable evidence that uh, doing a word with poverty um, has as a requisite uh, breaking the intergenerational transmission of poverty via fertility. That is that it is indispensable that the poor reduce their fertility to come out of poverty. Uh, I'm a little concerned that uh, these types of programs, at least in the midterm, seem to be offering an incentive to have more children to the extent that they reward the use of services by these children. Although in the long run, it may appear that they contribute to an increased value of children and probably the adoption of the small family norm. And I wonder if there's evidence to this respect. Hi, my name is Carla Tena. I'm from Georgetown. And I used to work in Malawi in the social cash transfer scheme. And my question is, for example, in Mexico, uh, Mr. Gomez, you were saying that it's difficult to have a cross-checking um, on education in the district because we don't have the capabilities or the tools to have a, I don't know, more technological system with the federal government. However, and social cash transfers, they have been demonstrating that people is investing in ed on education and on health. Uh, Boston University, they just came out with a, with an amazing evaluation about the impact of the of the cash transfers in Malawi. So is there a possibility of Mexico, Mexico try to adopt uh, a social, like no conditional transfer, if it's already proof that uh, it's impacting education and health in other countries? Okay, and one more, uh, Liz, right here. Um, 
Um, thanks for great presentations. I would appreciate hearing a little more, particularly in the Mexico case, about um, how you decided on the level of the of the transfer payment. Um, for instance, in education. Were you trying to just cover the um, additional costs of keeping a child in school, or were you the actual outlays, or were you also trying to cover the opportunity costs for a child being in school rather than working? You know, how did you decide how high this payment had to be to be effective? Okay, because we just I think that, as Michelle was saying, there's no evidence that these programs induce fertility, at least in the case of Mexico, it had been thoroughly studied. Fertility has been decreased, and now the national average is almost the same as the poor population average, because there was a difference there, the gap was there. So, no, because uh, there is a population policy in Mexico from the 70s and it's been growing and this kind of program taking women to the health services they are taking them to um, reproductive uh, health services so that has been proved is, it, it works um, I don't know if I understood correctly sorry for my English but um, I, I didn't say that we had problems to verify in fact, uh, what I said is that Mexico works like a payroll. <laughs> it verifies, it's, it's a Swiss clock in verifying the compliance of conditionalities. So my first answer, if I understood well, is there's no need to try another approach because this works. And if, it do, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But also evaluation has shown, and it's clearly in America Latina, in, in Ecuador, where they don't um, enforce the conditionalities. There is a difference of attendance to education in families that believe that the conditionality is verified and will be enforced, and the, the families that doesn't think or that no, it shouldn't be. There is a clear difference in attendance and enrollment school. And there is a, um, a small experimental test in Mexico in a place where some researcher found there was a mistake in operations and that people didn't got the, the formats for, for the verification of compliance. And there is a difference in, a, in attendance and enrollment. So uh, at least in the case of Mexico, Verifiance of verification of compliance is very important. It works. It works almost perfectly, not perfectly. 98% every two months of from 115,000 schools. What I said is that there is no online services in North. And, and what I was trying to say is that paper formats in paper go all the way from capitals in the states to the very isolated schools and health units in the rural areas. That was my, my, my point. And my point was that this is a logistics and, and um, operational uh, feature of, of this kind of programs in our context, because poor people tend to live in isolated places. <laughs> they live in the mountains, where the roads are the worst, that kind of things. There are schools and there are herd units there, but the transactions of the information is important thing. And the level of payment, it's uh, somehow complex, but the idea is to cover most, not all, the cost of opportunity. I think the technical figure is the 85 percentile of income of cost of opportunity, of probable income of the for age, but it's uh, you know more or less because it combines a lot of things and because also the the cash transfer is given to the mother and is added to a whole sum given to a particular mother, not to every child. What what we know also is that um, there's an impact in the in the decrease of child labor, especially in ages 12 to 18. So it's very interesting in that. Um, 
And the problem with the actual cost of, of, of education, there's no cost for education in Mexico, at least uh, fees or that kind of things. There are uh, books are part of the, of the system, the education system. So uh, transport could be an issue for uh, high school for the upper grades of secondary. Yeah, I just I want to follow up quickly on uh, Carlos's question about the um, about uh, the impacts on fertility. Uh, Nicaragua, a, a study there found an increase in birth spacing um, as a result of the, the program um, using the, the evaluation uh, data. And uh, in Turkey, we looked at that question specifically because it was a very big concern of the government and people in the health services. They had spent all this time trying to reduce, uh, to, to promote family planning. Um, they started calling it the pregnancy benefit. There was, because of the um, prenatal care and the uh, benefit for being uh, giving birth in a hospital, but uh, the impact we found no impact at all. And in the um, the qualitative work in the the, um, the household case studies, what we found was that there are very very strong pressures on on women um, on the one hand to get pregnant to have a lot of children. It's there. They said you know it's not the woman is not deciding or it's not money that makes us decide. It's the woman herself. It's her it's her husband and it's her mother-in-law who make who. who <laughs> is where most of the incentive comes from. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on them already to have a lot of children. And for people who are very poor, they're also aware of how much of burden additional child, uh, financial burden an additional child um, uh, puts on the family. And so those are both, those are pressures going in both directions. But ultimately, um, what it means is that the money itself, a small cash transfer is not, it's it just, it was a, it's not a big enough factor in comparison to those other things that have a larger influence on, on, on people's decisions, and it's um, and then the quantitative data supported the, that outcome as well. Okay, and up here, Andrew. I have a, a question, actually, um, on Rogelio's <coughs> point on supply and demand. I mean, I, clearly, from all the evidence in Mexico, people, children and young people are more educated, they are healthier, I mean, everything seems to be moving in the right direction, which are good outcomes in and of themselves. Oh, sorry, I should know the house rules here. Hi, Andrew Silly from the Wilson Center. Uh, the supply and demand, um, uh, just to follow the supply and demand question, I mean, there, there's a movement on health and education, which is a good in and of itself. That said, what's happening in terms of employment? And maybe it's too early to have results on this, because in, in terms of the supply and demand question, one of the other key supplies is that once people finish their education, that this should lead to other employment outcomes. I mean, clearly mm -hmm. health and education in and of themselves are goods, and everyone agrees on that. But if there isn't the kind of employment, is Mexico essentially creating you know, good outcomes for employment in the United States? You know, people are still getting uh, migrating <laughs> and El Salvador are the same. Okay, we'll keep this in house for one more second and go to Paulo for the Wilson Center's Brazil program. Hi, uh, my question relates to uh, something that the government of President Lula has been highlighting as far as Bolsa Familia uh, recently in the media. Uh, the fact that there are people volunteering to get out of Bolsa Familia, not many, 70,000 recently. Uh, more important that the government is denying acts, de denying benefits to, I think it's 5% of the people that received it last year because now they are at income levels that would not justify that. This is obviously uh, answer to criticism to the program. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know what is uh, the experience in Mexico is related to, I think, what Andrew just uh, asked, because obviously the proof of the success of the program ultimately will be that people won't need it, right? Uh, so I'd like to know, especially in Mexico, that is the pioneer in this, uh, how, how, what's the experience? Okay, and I think one more question right up here in front. Joan Nelson, uh, the Wilson Center and American University. Um, a question really for uh, any of the speakers. Um, I get the impression that at least in some of the press, the programs have expanded and diversified. Uh, the, the original very strong and rather simple link with, condi with, with conditioned or with 
co-responsibility uh, measures has, has somewhat diluted. In the early years of the development of these programs, part of their uh, political appeal was the tight link. Um, can, uh, has, has the idea of the cash transfers gained so much momentum that that tight link is really not particularly necessary for political sustainability anymore? Uh, or uh, is there some uh, lurking issue uh, of political sustainability as the programs expand to sort of a wider and wider array of social objectives and are extended to uh, households or to recipients, for example, without children uh, or, or uh, uh, where the degree of co-responsibility becomes rather minimal. I'll say something. <clears throat> um, well, certainly the link between um, regular welfare payments in the U.S. and uh, uh, making an effort to work is fundamental, and um, you know that's a co-responsibility of, of a sort. We just don't call it a, a CCT. Um, in the New York City program, uh, which is again layered on top of uh, the regular, uh, the existing safety net. Um, there's been a lot of debate around, uh, on the one hand, um, you know, the, the um, potential uh, incentive value and human capital building aspects of this program uh, versus uh, some of the implications or some of the things it may imply about poor people's efforts anyway. And, and is the problem of poverty um, the problem that uh, uh, poor people aren't making or won't make efforts to help themselves, or is it really um, a matter of uh, lack of uh, resources, uh, lack of uh, services, and all those things? Um, and there's a lot of debate about, uh, you, you know, the sort of the basic fundamental moral uh, issues. Some take great offense uh, at the idea that you have to pay parents uh, to do something that uh, they should be expected to do as a matter of course of being a good parent for the children. So those have been some of the terms of, of the debate. So I, I think, it, um, at least in the New York and the U.S. context, when you start talking about, you know, these conditionalities, I think it raises other kinds of questions that uh, don't get raised when you're talking about conditioning cash transfers on work, and maybe that don't get raised in the context of uh, other countries, where the CCT program is really their, in, uh, their implementation of a very very core uh, welfare system. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, the, the issue of employment in Mexico City, of course it's not growing as it should, and not in the areas it should, and not in the kind of jobs that it should be created. But that's beyond the program. It's a matter of, of economical policy and all other things. But what we tend to see it from the social perspective, we tend to see it the other way. If Mexico grows, if the jobs will be created somehow, then if we don't invest in these kind of families, they won't connect to the growing economy. And the preliminary results that are appearing in very preliminary evaluations is that they are more employable, have better employment, but it's a very small sample because the it started in 1997, but the interventions that matter were created in 2000 to give them three more years of education and the cycle of the program. Now, there is an evaluation, what we call a 10-year round, 1997 compared to 2007, and the results are coming. And some of the employment and migration um, 
impacts are there, but uh, they, I don't know them. They will be, um, they will be showed later. Um, my, my understanding of the Bolsa Familia is that they were doing two things. Once they began applying the sanction that they weren't applying before, so now some of the families that don't comply are being suspended their payments for, the, for those times, and also that they were uh, cleaning the registry. Um, let me say it that way, the, because as it's a municipal responsibility, they have problems with the, with the targeting, and they know it at the federal level um, <laughs> so m many of the families they are denying now it's because they uh, learned that they weren't eligible from the for the first point so okay S saying so I, I could say uh, Mexico has a permanent um, every two months the, the registry changes because people get suspended if they don't comply and the study made of the bajas, of the dropout, well, no, it's not dropouts, but, well, the bajas, okay. The dropouts from the, from the, from the registry demonstrate that the, the better their position in the socioeconomic um, study is more likely to, to go there to, to baja, to drop out, to, to leave compliance or leave the collecting of the, of the resources. So it's not made for targeting, but it contributes to a permanent better targeting. I don't know if I'm clear on this. And, and the other thing I could say is, let's, the success of this kind of programs is that the next generation wouldn't need it. Let's be clear on this. Not that the family, the program is not making anything to improve own income and better jobs and better uh, economic uh, performance of the parents of the family. So if the, econom the economy doesn't grow and the chronic poverty in the rural areas, because this is the, the hardcore. When, when we go for extreme poverty households in the urban levels, we will be dealing with chronic poverty coming from the rural areas migrated to cities or to transitory and very fluctuant uh, poverty, uh, income poverty that could go up and down depending on the job of the members of the family getting uh, income. So, but in the rural areas, the most hardcore and 70% of the registry of opportunities is, is in the rural areas, and most of it is in the indigenous southern Mexico, Oaxaca, Chiapas, uh, Guerrero, Veracruz, Puebla, that are the hard uh, parts of uh, poverty in Mexico for centuries. Uh, this kind of intervention is meant that the the students, the, the young, the children now that go beyond uh, education, that go to education, that advance through to to schooling, will not need opportunities, and that would be the that's the, that's the challenge. And unfortunately, it doesn't depend on opportunities. It depends on the economic <laughs> trends. It depends on policy dealing regional development. And it depends on education, quality on education on those places. They are more in a school, but what kind of schools? So that's a new agenda, I think, for, for in, the, in the discussion. How can we make an equality policy for quality in education in the poorest marginalized regions of our countries because now they are attending and they have incentives and clearly the the, the impacts in numbers and the, <laughs> the way things are happening there are you can see them and you can measure them in national statistics not only in impact evaluation but what education and what what would they get from there? That's the that's the key thing. Okay, um, I'm afraid we have to stop. We're already a couple minutes over. Um, I think the speakers will stick around a little bit if there are um, any follow-up questions, and. Um, I'd also like to remind you, since a couple of the speakers had to kind of go quickly through, the PowerPoints along with the video will be up in, on our websites within about a week or so. So come back and uh, look at it for more detail. Uh, but thanks again for coming and uh, spending your afternoon with us. And please join me in uh, thanking the speakers.